clear to update us uh, first. So Jonathan, please, the floor is yours. Uh, I hope that you're here now. I'm here. Thanks, Buzz. Just want to check that, that I'm audible. Can you hear me? Cool. Yeah. So, um, so just a little, just a couple of words of self-introduction. For the last 20 years, um, I've been an educator in sustainability studies and more recently regenerative economics. Uh, between Findhorn and Schumacher College. Um, I'm currently on a research sabbatical, having just left the college three weeks ago. Um, and I really wanted to, uh, I wanted to do a thought experiment, or maybe even more an imaginative experiment. Um, so what I'm really interested in is the importance and finding practices to enable us to transition from aboutness thinking to withinness thinking. This is a term uh, academic called John Shutter. Um, the, the idea of can we find ourselves in relationship to others in the other than human world, not as abstract theoretical observers, but as actually embedded deeply within, uh, with a sense of empathic identification within the web of life of which we're parts. Um, maybe just a little bit of a backstory here is that I did a, I did a TEDx talk at Findhorn some years ago uh, on embodied within this thinking um, and a, a critical friend afterwards said to me he watched the, the the talk and he said really the theme was embodied education and you spoke for 15 minutes <laughs> and that really threw out a challenge to me it's like how can how can um, I use this medium I really struggle with um, with uh, teaching online I'm very much a 20th century analog mammalian being who loves being in a room with people so for me, this is a real challenge is how can I use this medium in a way that is not talking about, but it is actually giving me and others a visceral feeling for not standing at a distance from the stuff that we're studying. So what I want to do is I want to lead us in a visualization. But before that, I, I just I want to read one introductory contextualizing uh, paragraph that sets up kind of the frame of our inquiry for the next 10 minutes. So my feeling is that the predominantly theoretical and abstract approach that dominates the modern classroom, even where those theories are informed by ecological thinking, keeps the living world at a distance, at the wrong end of a subject object relationship in which we are observers rather than participants and the earth is an object of study rather than a partner in the co-creation of knowledge. By excluding the body and emotions from the learning process, we remain essentially unmoved by the earth's suffering and poorly equipped to respond appropriately to that suffering. So that's my frame. It's the, the feeling that actually the that much of in the, the field of regenerative economics, much of the discussion has been about the curriculum, about changing one set of textbooks for another. And my increasing passion is for the pedagogy, it's for the rules governing how we, it's the process of learning uh, that I'm much more interested in since it feels to have much more creative transformative power. So what I wanna do is I want to invite you soon to close your eyes and try to respond to the pictures that I'm hoping to create. Uh, and those pictures are uh, drawn from various different practices and educational activities that I stroke we as a, as a faculty at Schumacher have developed. Um, maybe just one last bit of theory before, before we move into this is that I'm really drawing on um, recent insights coming from neuroscientific studies that suggest that the, the, the physiological impact of um, thinking about something, about holding a child, cuddling a puppy, playing music, tasting sour fruit, is largely the same as actually performing the act. So in other words, simply by thinking about it, by visualizing it, we have a very similar physiological impact. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to create a, a, just a, a few vignettes of activities that we do at the college with the aim of not talking about stuff, but giving us all an opportunity to actually inhabit more fully the experience. 
That clear? Great. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and use your imaginative muscle to, or your imagine, that's the wrong metaphor, use your imaginative capacities to feel your way into the scenario I'm describing. See if you get some of the withinness thinking, feeling, experience, rather than simply abstractly looking from the outside. So the first vignette is students, and these are students of economics and holistic science, spending two or three afternoons intensely studying the movements of jackdaws, jackdaws being uh, in the crow family, the black raucous birds that often swirl around the trees and make a lot of noise. So spending three afternoons watching, doing nothing, just watching. Picture how that might be. And then gathering in the forest and performing a jackdaw dance. Mm. So really having watched and having somehow felt their way into the spirit of Jackdaw, recreating the kind of dance based on um, their observations. Vignette number two. Um, economic students doing a solo fasting, overnight fasting vigil in the forest finding a space, finding a sit spot that really calls them and feeling into a new within, within this relationship with the tree in the forest. Third, this is something I developed in, with colleagues in Findhorn, is having looked at the data emerging from ecological footprinting, so really looking at the, the size of our weight on, on, on the ecosystems in our places from our consumption and waste generation activities. So having got the data, creating circles on the village green that represent the size of the footprints taken within four different contexts. The first is North American circle, huge long fingertip to fingertip circle. Second circle is a Western European circle, generous but not as big. Third circle, a, a Central American, Central European, much more, much smaller, tighter circle. And finally an African circle, which is just a, um, very tight huddle of people. And again, see if you can think, feel your way into being in one of those circles and just watching the other circles, releasing known ideological positions and just feeling somatically, how does it feel? I'll do just one more vignette. Um, a moment, the subject we're studying being the enclosure of the commons. One day one spent looking at the data, looking at the facts, looking at the history of the enclosure movement. Day two, a day designed by two students as a way of further deepening the student experience where they turn up at the beginning of the day and say to their fellow students, the college is completely messed up and they've, there's a short course has come in and they've taken our classroom and they've taken our key teacher and um, they're apologizing, but we don't, uh, they just, there's nowhere for us to go. And the student reaction being anything in a range from total disempowerment to rage. And then it becomes clear that actually there's no one in the room at all that actually it was just a, a piece of, a piece of theater to give them a sense, just a hint of what it is to have their own common space commandeered by others. 
Okay, so I'm inviting you to open your eyes. We could do this for the whole morning. Um, but uh, I just like it, it, so my, in conclusion, my experience as an educator is that when we can find a way of engaging the emotions, the body somatically in the learning process, that there, it invites in a level of passion and you know, fierce, loving identification, empathic identification, rather than a cold, abstract, clever thinking about. And at the moment, my challenge as an educator, my, the research sabbatical I'm on, is asking the question, how do we take this way of working into mainstream education? And with that, I'm passing the baton to Morag. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Which images, I can imagine myself there in the forest on the date, exploring that and, and feeling the soul. I was actually walking up through my garden today, and at the moment we're in flood here, and I was just, I was feeling my foot sink into the ground. The whole soil was so sodden that I was just sinking as I walked. Only a, a few weeks ago, when I walked there, it was hard and dusty. And this whole part of really feeling that embodiment of, of the learning, one of the things that I encourage people to do, I'm a permaculture teacher. I actually, I teach permaculture teachers and um, is to take that really embodied approach to learning and sharing about. it's not to go out and teach like like Jonathan was saying it's not abouting about soil like how, how do we become to know soil how do we come to know what is living soil the feel the taste the texture the, the feeling underfoot so instead of going out with with uh, soil measuring sticks for temperature or for the moisture content or for what the pH is go out and we feel it underfoot what does it feel like what does it smell like possibly what even does it taste like and so this this sense so I do actually do a very blended learning um, approach of being both online using these spaces and at the same time encouraging people to go into these uh, localized community spaces where they can um, really dive into that and and so I I've actually come to love these spaces they become a point of connection where we we're simultaneously in the online space and digital and and the and the lived experience space and we're both at one time local and global and one of the stories that i wanted to share with you where i found this to be incredibly powerful um, is in the work that we're doing um, with refugee communities all throughout east africa so I run something called the Permaculture Education Institute. And one of the reasons I, I ex explored putting this work online, uh, I've been teaching this for as long as I can remember, but I put it online because I was feeling the urgency of the need for regenerative education, accessible regenerative education that anyone could pick up anywhere. And, uh, and, and so I wanted to be able to give it out to people in refugee settlements or to you what we found was that it's so I every time someone signs up to a course I, I give away at least three places uh, for refugees but what happens is that we, they get to the point where it's like we don't have the data access or they don't and so I found these huge limitations so I've, so what we've done is we've found some key people who are able to access it and we support them to create pop-up theatres pop-up classrooms garden spaces spaces that they can then um, go and, and share it out. And what happens is that they bring the stories back into the global learning community. So instead of abouting about the refugee issue, we are in daily conversation. Uh, and similarly with Indigenous communities in Australia. So we're able to um, bring the conversations together and weave those threads. And it's been an incredibly powerful journey. And I think one of the things that's really um, I've learned so much from, there is a curriculum that goes with permaculture and I've really tried to almost 
throw that out the window, not entirely, it's there, it's, it's kind of submerged, but where the juiciness of this regenerative education approach comes in is in, the, in being in a shared experience of being totally embedded in what you're doing in your own place, in your own community and um, bringing that together. So we've, we have design labs and education labs where people are um, sharing different approaches uh, and actually teaching each other how to teach. So it's rather than me teaching them, we're in it together. But what I wanted to say was that actually it's the youth which has been the key. Um, I, I also work with something called the Perma Youth and uh, that's emerged out of young people after the big rallies that were happening a couple of years ago, coming back and saying, that felt really potent and important, but yet it was one day. What do we do today? in our school, what do we do tomorrow? What do we do at home? And so they together formed this global network of um, young people who are coming together and they call themselves practivists. And the way that it connects with our, our, our theme of today around art is that I offered them the permaculture curriculum. I said, look, you know, I can share this with you. You know, I can walk you through this. And they kind of very politely said, no, thanks, that's all right, we're good. <laughs> And with that, they started to um, start learning with an intent, with a direction and allowing to unfold and emerge. And what they've done is been far well and beyond the curriculum that is set up with permaculture. They've brought in people, young people who've been doing, you know, um, work on Zanzibar, working with young children in schools there, um, a young man from refugee settlements in Tanzania who's setting up food for us for all the schools, from someone in New York who's doing rooftop gardening, and together they're sharing their lived experience and inspiring one another and creating free festivals. So they're doing it through this artistic approach. They're bringing in music and um, photography, writing. It's the, the learning is coming through them co-creating their understanding of what it means to live regeneratively, what it means to live well, how they can address their fears and their hopes and do it in a way that is on their terms and inviting in the people that they feel that they need to nourish them rather than being stick, stuck into a curriculum. So I've taken this inspiration from them to redesign and recreate how I, how I offer my adult education programs. And I was going down the rabbit hole recently of, of taking all the work that I'm doing and, and putting it into a university context as a, as a sort of a, uh, what we call it, an elective or something that could be taken by a whole lot of different professional groups. And in, and in the end, uh, it was just starting to feel like it was closing in that the, the, the creativeness of it was starting to be sort of sheared off and, um, and it would end up being a bit of an abouting rather than the lifing. And so we, we, we now have something called, for want of a better word, we haven't really, we're waiting for the youth to kind of create it, is this Ethos Fellowship. It's a group of young people from around the world who are mapping out together how they want to to be, and they're inviting in elders like Fritjof Capra, like um, Jeremy Lent. They would love to invite you, Daniel, and you, Jonathan, and people from around the world who have, so they're creating their own university course. They don't care whether they get the, a certificate from it, but it's kind of like a university without walls, focusing on the things that really matter to them, practicing it, and in underpinning everything that they know about uh, that, that, sorry, underpinning everything that they know with elders and thinkers and thought leaders and philosophers and writers and artists and musicians. And I don't know where it's going. Honestly, I have no idea. But I'm just here to kind of hold the space and back them up if they need it and, and um, maybe make a few connections for them. And so that's kind of what I wanted to share with you is I've, I'm learning to let go of what I think education should be and it's kind of scary sometimes because people pay me to to come and do my course and I 
think that they expect me to deliver a certain thing. But the more that I let go and just have this course over the side that people can walk through, but co-creating this opportunity. So within my permaculture course, we have pollination sessions. We have, um, you know, labs and, like I said, studios and, and um, sharing sessions and videos and music uh, where uh, it's, it's exciting. You know, for me, it doesn't feel like each time I'm kind of delivering the same stuff anymore. It's coming back into being present and being part of this global learning community and that I am on the learning journey as much as anyone else. I just happen to be the host. And uh, with that, I'll um, pass the baton to Daniel. Wow, how wonderful to be with Morak and, um, and Jonathan and, and Bas today and, and with all of you. Um, I mean, uh, Jonathan and I go back a long, long time and Morak and I know of each other for a long, long time and met each other finally a few years back. And yeah, this, this was lovely, both, both of your um, contributions and it opens up a wonderful space because like the, the conference in itself, um, reimagining education it, for me is like, I, I remember Jonathan used to quite often when teaching the EDE say, say to people like this whole thing about what is work, what is life. I love my work so much that I don't make that boundary um, and I, have, I haven't made it for years. But um, what would it mean if we extend that and say uh, education, like basically there's this, this platitude, which is not a platitude. You live and you learn, otherwise you don't live very long. And that means education is actually a process that isn't the first third of our life and then we work and then we retire that that was for a privileged few at any point in history and it's a model that is unlikely to continue education has to be just as johnson says it's a constant embodied process about making everything like the i'm renovating a house now the way i meet those builders and the question i ask them about the materials I, they're educating me about the world of building on this island I live in, and it's um, it's a tough education. <laughs> but at the same time, the question I'm ask, asking them about, what is this material? Where does it come from? Where is it produced? Um, is also an education. And 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 so I'm, I'm more and more trying to say, well, how do we, like, to live into, how do I live my life as a constant opportunity of education? But I also wanted to share, because Jonathan ended with this question of how do we take this kind of um, within this thinking and within this education into mainstream education and, and, and the, the, the difficulty of transferring in this space where more and more learning is online, people back into the real world rather than into these spaces that we're currently in. And I've been for the last two years working with a wonderful um, academic called Professor Tobias Lute, one of these people who are inside the system really trying to break it open. He's, he's a high mountain guide, uh, ski guide, dog sledging, kite skiing, you name it, extreme sport runner. And at the same time, he's a professor at three different design schools, and one of them being ETH um, Zurich, which is kind of one of the, the, the really um, leading institutions, academia, mainstream, as Jonathan was, was questioning. And, and they're launching next month a MOOC called Designing Rege uh, Regenerative and Resilient Systems that hopefully is the beginning of a larger ecosystem we're trying to create. And in, in helping to be as designed this MOOC, we were just asking exactly these questions. And I learned a lot from him because he's been um, grappling with this. How do I get people into the body? Like one thing that for years I've used the toolbox of Joanna Macy's work that reconnects to do this kind of taking people back into an embodied relational feeling of themselves as nature. But um, using pushing people to their physical boundary like so you can do it with a beautiful space you can just go hiking in a beautiful space and it opens people up to a way that then whatever homeopathic input comes in lands in them in a way that they can assimilate it that it serves themselves because i, th I think the the only matisse that i would add to what we said is 
in general, we have a tendency to oversteer. If we have an education that was about us thinking for far too long, we, we then want only witness thinking. But maybe we can ask ourselves also, how can we create an education that honors input in order to then like, so because I've, I've been sitting with this a lot, like I've, I've been in the, the meeting, the, the movements where we meet Jonathan and, and, and Morak and I are the participatory education that don't do, do the PowerPoint thing. And um, I've always felt like, is there not a blend where through showing people real world projects of the amazing, like Morag was describing, like the, the young permaculture youth was designing for themselves, showing real world projects that do teach. When you then ask them, envision your place new, they will have a broader palette to draw from when they do the envisioning. So, so education isn't entirely about drawing out. It is, it is about enabling to find the information you need at that point in time. And, and I, I think the, the, the only thing that I, in our discussion now uh, that I would bring out is how do we find the, the balance? Because to bring it into mainstream education was exactly that, to say, how do we do a MOOC, but then invite everybody who's on the MOOC to actually go into special places in nature and do certain reflections and then create a loop of feedback into the system that actually sort of somewhat obliges people to, to actually go out there. And then how you blend this weird reality of getting people to maybe reflect to a mobile phone for 60 seconds and use that as part of the assessment and the feedback or the, 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 the way that you create a shared community with people, people that are actually in different places. Because ultimately, and I'll stop with that, for me, Regenerative education is about re-inhabitation and regeneration is about re-inhabitation. How do we re-inhabit our bodies? How do we re-inhabit our communities? How do we re-inhabit life, our own agency as life? And, and how do we, through that, build right relationships? It's, it's all about right relationships. And, and, how, how, and, and if you live your life as education, then every opportunity, everybody you meet is an opportunity to be educated. And what a wonderful world we would create if we see each other as an opportunity to learn all the time. That is uh, just to be absolutely clear that clap is for all three of you. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing all of these wonderful stories and highlights. And we're about to open it up for um, for everyone to participate, maybe with some questions and dialogue, but it also feels like a good time to share a little bit of uh, a short reflection of what I've just heard uh, in multiple levels. As you probably hear my mother somewhere downstairs, I apologize for that. <laughs> well, I don't actually, she's a nice lady. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, I can see, you know, I'm also in formal higher education and, and those, those, those emerging forms of regenerative education really are starting to become visible in more and more places. So I really would like to, to stress and highlight that, that those niches, um, those, 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 those ecotones in a way, they, they are emerging. And there are some really strong signs that, that major institutions are also uh, moving in this direction. They may use different language uh, for some of it, but uh, for example, Erasmus University just released uh, a statement that basically rethinks their entire purpose and also Wageningen University and others. So please don't lose that hope um, that I think was so strongly nurtured. And um, also, I really liked all of the different comments that, and, and, and perspectives that were shared about where the artistry of regenerative education lies. And some people may wonder why we chose the title uh, or partly why did we chose this title. And, and there's this really nice quote in one of the latest books of uh, Bista, who's a, a philosopher of education, where he says, educational sciences uh, are a fairly practical art and at their best should inform the artistry of others, which I think is the intention of this session and the dialogues as well. And what it really has it reiterated for me at least is that that is a multi-level form of art 
you know, it's an art that is in you and your engagement and your relational entanglements with the world and the students. And there's also a lot of artistry in Morax, Leap of Faith, you know, opening up and having that courage and vulnerability to just say, you know what, I don't know what is going to emerge, but I'm going to give it the space and I'm going to give it the nutrients and the energy and maybe something beautiful can pop up. And I just, I just really wanted to share that. Um, if there's anyone who would like to, to join in the conversation, uh, please feel free to do so. You can raise your hand or you can just, uh, I see a first question from Lisa already. Maybe you'd like to ask it. I think I did ask it. I put it in the chat. <laughs> oh. um, but as, as I was listening, um, I, I spent a lot of time watching babies. And I, I think it's my observation that we're born with the withinness that we're talking about. And I keep asking, why do we, uh, why do we try to shut that down? Why do we create classrooms which are basically sensory deprived environments? And um, if we didn't do that in the first place, um, we don't know what would happen because we've been doing it for so many generations that, um, that we're all kind of, um, many of us are in the about space. Um, so it's a question that I pose. Um. Does anyone want to share some thoughts or respond? Let me just, just briefly, oh, sorry, I'll just jump in quickly because I think that what is happening around the world because of everything that's happened over the last couple of years is that maybe we might have a bit of an insight into that because there's been so many people who have come out of the classrooms so many people who are not going back into the classrooms. And you, I, I don't know whether we, we know yet, but it feels like there's this really potent space here right now. And, and also a lot of young people coming out of that. Uh, and I, I hear them in the oh, yeah. as we do, because they're saying, look, you know, we're we listening to what's going on in the world. We know what the science is saying. We hear you know, what the messages are, you know, if we continue and finish going through that and to be active in the world, like it just is, it feels like it's way too late. We need, we want to start really living now and being fully present and, and engaging. That's like two different kind of threads of the conversation, but I feel like there's, there's again, it's like leaping into a whole new state of being with this. And for and as an educator, to kind of let go of what I thought I knew about how to do this and to just be fully present and mindful and noticing, creating a spaciousness where this exploration can happen and where the practices can emerge. We don't know what they are, but what is the context that we can create that will enable that to start to to find find root and and start to flourish just briefly pick up on context because for me this is where one of the key framings that i've learned from my friends at regenesis group and from carol samford the, the the sort of essence of of the um regenerative development thinking that they've curated over over many years is this flip from trying to like young people are fit, are being bombarded with problems and we're all being bombarded with problems and the world has made itself so complex that we feel completely unable to respond but the minute you use the lens of place and re-inhabitation of body community and place and region as the lens through which you stop abstracting into problems and you go into the withinness of the real phenomena in front of us, the real human relationship, the messiness of all the politikeo, the, the political problems and the economic problems and all of that. But when you, when, you, when you actually look at all those problems in the specificity of the biocultural uniqueness of place 
and you really learn them, then suddenly pop, it, it's one of those Kuhnian Gestalt switches, the, the, the problems become opportunity, the problems become potential. And what we need to do is to engage people to see that potential in each other, in their ecosystem, in their region again, because that's how we can build the lifeboats or the healthy, rebuild the healthy system. It's, it's a two-pronged strategy with, in an extinction emergency. So on the one hand, enable people to educate themselves in the process of building community resilience and regenerating their own bioregion is a pathway that makes us weather the storm more easily if it's already too late and is also the pathway that we can we can't heal the planet we can only heal places and and this kind of rethinking education is at the heart of it if we get people to understand that education is lifelong and that the way to put Humpty Dumpty of splitting everything into too many disciplines and aboutness thinking back together again is the simple flip to go to the specificity of what does chemistry, geology, sociology, biology have to say about this place, my place? How can I fall in love with the detail of every little bug, every soil biota, every waterway in this place by understanding it, by understanding my interconnection with it, by my understanding my own interbeing with it. And, and I think we're, we're building these education programs all over the world right now. And then both Jonathan and Morak are pioneers in this. And we've only got 13 minutes left, so I'll shut up. Well, thank you both of you for those very thoughtful answers. Uh, I believe that Safundi, that you were first with your digital hand. Um, so please uh, feel free to contribute. Safundi, right? Yeah, was it yeah. me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Bas, for opening up for open conversation. Um, so I want to go back to uh, Jonathan's visualization where he asked us to imagine the, the circles of carbon footprint. And, uh, and what I saw, because I live in Sri Lanka in an island, and what I saw was me outside all of these big circles, starting from the US and the European one, and just this big tsunami coming over me, which is, you know, probably the reality that we will have to face um, if things go, um, you know, without changing. Um, and in terms of uh, what I'm doing on the ground right now, um, I have set up an organization called Green Life Generation, um, where I have established this 3E model of education, which is um, employment, entrepreneurship, and education in one, and it's a lifelong work-based learning program. Um, so I'll share on the link uh, what we are doing with waste management, but um, we are trying to move from uh, into this responsible consumption and production. And uh, for the young uh, in the community, uh, we're building this climate smart classroom. And uh, in pictures, we have shown the the two paths that we can take and what would happen. And the challenge for me has been like, how do we make it not a competitive task? Because the, the, the youth, the system has created a very competitive system where if you want to engage in a task, you want to see what's the outcome, who becomes first. And so that has been the challenge in kind of taking that layer away in the, uh, in the way we educate and build the collective consciousness, but still get them engaged in these activities of like accomplishment. Um, so yeah, that is where I am. We are trying, to, we are starting with sustainable mobility and trying to give every two weeks a task where they can come into the classroom, use all these waste materials and build some sort of, you know, alternative mo mobile device, you know, device or something like that. Uh, but then like initially, even my thinking was like, okay, who's going to be, who's going to win the race, you know, this kind of attitudes. But you know, we are still creating the program, but yeah, this is the, the, the challenging part of like, how do we move also away from that, that achievement based system into a more collective uh, uh, movement in the communities. Thank you, Jonathan, would you like to respond? 
Um, I just want to, I mean, first of all, I've, I've, uh, I, I, I used to work with Sarvodia in Sri Lanka and I've a great love for the country. So I just, I, I'm delighted that you're doing such good work. I just, I wanted to pull together something that you said together with what Lisa said about the kind of crazy conventions that we now have in education, um, and particularly around collaboration. So the, 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 um, one of the core assumptions underlying the dominant educational model is that collaboration is cheating because it's an individualistic competitive pursuit. And it's, it's a kind of idea that until we look at it from the outside, we just accept it. Well, that's what education is. And of course, it's totally absurd. And, um, you know, we learn collaboratively. We are a social species. Um, yeah, that's me. No, great, thank you. It's all, I'm always hesitant and a, a little bit hesitant with these types of, of considerations because, well, it links to something that Daniel said earlier. It's very easy to go from one extreme to the other. So I'm always a bit hesitant, like, should we let go of everything related to competition and move completely to collaboration? Or should we, you know, look at ecological systems where you also have a balance between the two? Um, but yeah. Thank you for that thoughtful answer. Um, Anna, I Actually, can I just, can I, can I very, just briefly come back to this, that at the moment, the, the, the weighting is so much in individualism and competitiveness and intellectual left brain mm. stimulation that, that I don't think anybody is suggesting that we abandon that at all, but that clearly the pendulum needs to swing back to a much saner middle position. Right, so we need to re refine the better balance with that. Totally. Yeah, cool. Nice. Thank you very much. Anna, I believe you were next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bas. Um, a couple of reflections for me as well, uh, and also questions that we've been pondering for a couple of years over here in uh, Eastern Europe. I'm, I'm joining in from Romania. Um, and um, referring a little bit back to what Lisa was, Lisa was saying, I think, about the, the question about why do we still design this kind of systems? Like who do they suit and why, why do we do it when we know they're, they're not working and they're not serving us anymore? And um, unfortunately they are working and they are serving the people who design them. Uh, over here, and it's very refreshing to see um, so many amazing examples and being part of Ecoversities for the past uh, three or four years has been a breath of fresh air in terms of models and examples and connections and bridging the gap with what we're doing over here in Romania. But when I'm looking at the kind of education system that we have here, it's completely suiting the governments and the people who are designing it because it's the same factory model. The education system, at least over here, and. I'm gonna to refer to Romania, but I think I can generalize a little bit towards the whole uh, Eastern Europe form, former Soviet uh, communist bloc. Uh, education has not changed in the past 30 years because it doesn't suit the people at the top of the pyramid to change because you need to put this framework into place in order to, for the young people of today to become the people that you need them tomorrow not being able to think by themselves to raise their voice, to change the system. Um, so the people who are moving into the regenerative education space over here and a couple of re really nice and interesting models that I've connected with recently in the whole part of the Balkans and then uh, on the other side of the of the Black Sea as well, um, so Armenia and the rest of the wonderful countries over there. Um, we have not found our way into the cracks of the system yet. We know of scholars who do things differently and who um, experiment with different ways of doing things. But whenever we talk about re regenerative education right now, and there are some fantastic models, um, experiencing, experiencing with self-directed learning models, and I've shared the link in the chat, we've run a project for 10 years uh, in which we asked ourselves, how would university look like if it would actually suit the learner, if it would be designed by the learner, for the learner, 
with support from learning facilitators, which would be the adults. And we've managed it. The kind of learning community that we've designed has transformed our lives, the 300, 400 people that we've been through it. Um, we did not manage to get a credit in any way up to the point that from the third year onwards, we still called ourselves a university, but we completely dropped the idea of even, even trying to get accredited in any way. And then one, one bridge that we could have found is one of the projects that we have in our university is called Autonomy in Learning. It's a one-on-one -on -one process we, in which our students um, have a learning counselor, we call it, which supports them understand who they are as learners, uh, what kind of learning styles suit them and how they can design their own learning journeys, accessing different resources that are around them. Uh, we felt that in a system, from an education point of view, a system so oppressed as the one we have over here in Romania, supporting young people understand how they can learn best by themselves, this could be the key. However, even in introducing this kind of one-on-one -on -one process in the education system, go taking it into a couple of schools it has been um very difficult up to um impossible so far so those of us who still do it and we've been doing it for 10 for 15 years we just go along and do our way in spite of what's happening in the system um i'm, I'm speaking right now also a little bit emotional with what, what's happening in the region i'm going to go to a protest uh, in a couple of hours. So I'm sorry if I'm bringing this kind of, of energy. Uh, I just want to honor all this beauty of examples that you're bringing here and the fact that hearing you talk about bridging this gap with uh, the higher education and the, the, the education system as a whole, that is incredibly refreshing. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that there are regions in the world which are much more behind. And for us, it's easier to completely build an alternative outside of the system right now, rather than even try to bridge the gap with the system itself. Thank you very much for sharing all of that. And also, uh, well, at least I speak for myself, I hope I speak for others as well when I say that my heart also aches for the situation that's, that's going on near you right now. Um, I wish you a lot of strength in that as well. I'm, uh, looking at the time, what I would suggest, if it's okay for the others, is that Lars, you also share your reflections and questions, and we finish with a final round uh, going through the guests uh, so that they can respond to both at the same time, if that's okay. Uh, please, Lars, go ahead. Cheers. Um, yeah, first of all, big, big pleasure to to get all the inputs and, and, and hear and sense what's what's been shared um, um and yes just maybe just briefly referring that was coming to the last chain was really that i have the feeling that is that is not one solution eh? it's really a, a like a dance in different parts to whatever is is you know whatever challenge is arising in in, in which which way um so since I've been most of the time in 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 or in the in the in the context that Jonathan or Daniel was referring to also geologically, um, I wanted to kind of just refer shortly to the to the question how we do we take this into mainstream education and uh, the challenge of you know to the within understanding. Um, my background is is coming from acting and dance and. Uh, in acting, what I sensed as the central thing and understanding was that you learn to understand yourself as an instrument. And on the somatic level, intellectual level, um, spiritual level. And so with that, that what one that I want to refer to, there's a training. You train also imagination, as Jonathan in the beginning, as a muscle, so to speak. And so you, you train sensory awareness you train um, psychological awareness, psychological understanding, yeah? And so with that, that's a process. And with that comes also a certain, um, an empathy, um, an understanding of empathy to the character that you're playing because you have to somehow, you know, enter in there. 
And so to me in my process, it was, okay, how do I can, how can I take this to a larger context to enter into the non-human world, you see? And I tried to facilitate this in courses when I was trying to kind of connect to also the academic circles, which was, or still is very difficult because uh, I am, my background was as everything was separate in the performing arts. And so, but my sensation is in terms of one of the instruments or tools that would be there, I think, is to, to invite people who have made the round, so to speak, from, from acting and dance um, into ecological, deep ecological understanding, permaculture understanding, and activities, uh, gardening activities, uh, you know, deep listening activities, understanding of improvisation that you take from the art forms of how to deal with the unknown that presents itself right here, right now, how to dance with the whole thing at this point. And um, so to me, it would be great pleasure to keep kind of connecting out to whoever re resonates with this, you know, um, accesses because I find that there's a huge potential in there and it takes it takes a training you know it's it, it is surely an opening within three days of you know um, observing uh, the the jack door and I think it's wonderful that this is is happening um, but just to keep in mind that it is a training and every instrument is different so for some the observance will make maybe do it for others it will be the theoretical research because they function different. So it's really a, a very delicate journey and an inquiry, I think. But I, I think uh, to me, again, I profoundly appreciate the, the, what I see and hear and, and learn here. And just, just yes, and anyway, so thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time, so we're gonna move towards wrapping up. Uh, I promise each of the guests the opportunity to reply to your reflections as well as those of Anna or any anything else that was shared today. Um, Maura, can I ask you if you would like to share something? There's so many things, but I, I in in wanting to be brief, uh, just picking up on what Lars said there about dance and uh, what I feel also what I feel is when you're in the when you're in the garden with permaculture that. It is about becoming the garden gardening. You're not the gardener in the garden. You are part of this community. And it's this that immersion process that I think just is has profound uh, impacts on it. And I so and the dance, the dance of all of those species together in the garden, uh, and then learning from indigenous uh, elders about how how what is going on in country is danced and sung and that communication comes through that way and so what is the dance that we dance in communicating what is that how can we bring that back in so that's part of what i feel like the youth are teaching us through the perma youth as well that's by bring the culture back into permaculture and um so many different threads to pick up on. I also loved what you said too, Lisa, about there is no outside. And uh, anyway, I, lots of things to keep going on. I wish we had more time, but I will hand over to either Jonathan or Daniel, who whoever would like to hand it. Thank you everyone for being here. It's been a really lovely conversation to, to be here with you. And thank you, Baz, for hosting. So Baz, I'm, I'm hoping that um, we're able to share emails here. Um, I'm particularly interested in contacting Lars. Uh, so my, my continuing professional development CPD training budget has largely been spent on theater, impro, constellation facilitation, for exactly the reasons you, you're mentioning. Um, and like, so I think that, um, that a really sound, hard-nosed, intelligent understanding of political economy and global power relations is essential but economics textbooks are not gonna revolutionize the world. Whereas theater and the arts has got a much greater chance. And in fact, in the program that I've created here, 
the, the regenerative economics program, the final module is called Changing the Frame, which draws explicitly on the artistic community, collaborating with political economists to develop memes and, you know, just and consciousness changing activities. Uh, the, the only other thing I wanted to say was really to strongly underline what Daniel said about um, um, the, the specificity of place and our tendency to, to look at for global abstract solutions, when in fact, we all need to be prototyping in our own bioregions and, and um, um, recognizing that at the heart of the problem, if you go way upstream, like what is the root of the problem? And the root of the problem is our feelings of separation from each other than the ultimate human world. And actually it is by rejoining the community of beings that are the only ones we've got access to are the ones in our own place. So it's like becoming, um, m turning down the volume in theory and turning up the volume on, on observation and participation. Daniel. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, that, for me, that, that wonderful term of the poet of the 1970s bioregional movement in the US, uh, that term re-inhabitation speaks to that. How, how do we re-inhabit our direct lived relationship with the ecosystem that brought us forth? I've just planted 210 trees in the last 12 weeks in a, in a food forest I'm, I'm, I'm starting. And the process of working with that land over a year before the trees went in has been a cellular process of learning that exactly the, the garden gardening, the, 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 the embodied experience of walking from A to B and being sidetracked by something. And then an hour later realizing, ah, I never went there, but I just did this because the garden asked me to do it. And, but I also wanted to just as a final thing, because we're all out of time last, you really nailed it with your last comment and you were so patient because you had, you had your hand up first and, and, and got to speak last. Um, thanks, thanks for the patience. And it was perfect because in my own learning, like I always remember when, when I did the Masters in Holistic Science at Schumacher College, um, very heady course at the time in 2001, um, I, I met a brilliant man called, um, Arthur Zions, who was a physicist of laser light, but at the same time, the guy who set up the Mind Life Institute, the conversations between the Dalai Lama and, and leading scientists about reality. And, and he said to me at the time, Daniel, the next great revolution in human affairs is not going to come through the sciences, it's going to come through the arts. And I was studying holistic science and thought that that was the solution to the world. <laughs> I was really <laughs> annoyed with it at first. <laughs> um, but I've been on a journey for, of 20 years, and it's still unfolding to see that he was absolutely right. And, and that's, I put in the chat a conversation that we had at the beginning of the year hosted by Hawkwood College. I, I think that this whole notion of regenerative culture needs the poets, the musicians, the dancers, the songwriters, um, every expressive art possible, because that's how we always change culture. We never, like, of course there are, thought leaders that create new memes that influence this discourse, but it's when the artists pick them up and make them palpable, embodied, not about this thinking, but within this thinking, then, then suddenly culture changes. So thank you for bringing that in and, and let's all bring culture back into the, the systems change conversation because we're all actually co-creating the system every second. Voila, let's hook up and join forces. <laughs> thank you everybody today for this very amazing hour uh i'm definitely leaving very inspired and uh, full of magic for the, at least the rest of my day um just to remind everybody if you want to get in contact with one of the speakers today then the organization can help with that so you can share uh send a message there um i know well, at least lars you want to get connected and maybe there's others as well and if there's any follow-up questions uh, that we're not able to be discussed today, please feel free to share them and uh, we'll try to get uh, back to those, I think. Other than that, there's nothing left for me to do than to thank everybody one more time and wish you a great day. And that's my alarm. <laughs>